Welcome to the Ironwood Strength Show. This is episode 7. Um, today is Saturday, November 11th, 2023. Um, information here, raw, unscripted, and unedited. So first thing I want to do is I want to kind of recap a little bit over my last episode, episode 6, where I went over the warm-up. Um, I don't even go back and watch these videos. I just I, I film them put them up and let them be uh, but I do want to touch on some stuff I was thinking about it afterwards that I didn't I don't think I made myself I was kind of I wasn't I wasn't at my best last week so I think I missed some things and uh, want to hit that just really quick uh, the structure of the warm-up that I like is going to be your dynamic flexibility first then you're going to move into um, your activation exercises along with your prehab exercises, and I think I missed that last week. Um, I didn't really get into the prehab part of it, uh, which is, is important to me as far as being able to prevent injuries in any given sport, whether it's um, soccer, baseball, uh, powerlifting, whatever you're doing, each sport has a set of injuries and they should be addressed from a rehab or a prehab standpoint. Um, and on a... On a uh, on a on a basis of targeting what you're actually faced with in that sport. Okay, so um, baseball, you know, you're going to need a lot of rotator cuff work. Uh, soccer, you might do some extra ankle work or some extra uh, knee prehab. They have a lot of knee injuries there. Um, so, and those exercises are picked based off what sport you are working with. Uh, I would not consider them sport specific. But in the terms of injuries, I guess they are kind of injury slash sport specific. Um, so that was an important part of my warm up. I don't think I really hit that last week uh, when I was talking about different types of warm ups and the structure of those. Um, and, and then from the the prehab and the activation, the prehab can kind of go together. And then from there, you would move on uh, to your more specific warm up of what you're actually going to be doing. Um, so enough of that, and I'll leave it, leave that to you as far as how you apply that to your warm-ups. Uh, but I did want to recap that. Uh, today, I'm going to go start going over the different means of preparation for sport. So uh, GPP is one of those that often gets completely misconstrued. I'm not going to go over that one today. Uh, today, I'm going to hit SSP and SPP. Okay, and, and for what those are, SSP is the most important thing going into sport training, and that's sport-specific preparedness. SPP is special physical preparedness. Okay, and these two play very important roles, um, and they should be looked at differently. Very important as far as how you, this is a topic that really interests me, um, and it's very important that you understand these concepts if you have control of the training process, if you, um, most strength coaches do not have control at the college level, because I can't speak to other levels, uh, do not have control of the total training process. They only have control of, for the most part, the GPP portion of the training. Even in some cases that they don't have total control. Um, but the creative coach can find ways, hopefully, to work SPP, special physical preparedness, into that training. Uh, probably, if they have the knowledge base, probably more, not more efficiently. In some areas, could be more efficient than the sport coach doing it. Um, for the most parts, the sport coach controls these two parts of, the, of training, is the sport-specific part and the special physical preparedness part. Uh, the sport coach will control most of that, uh, but the, a good creative uh, strength coach can start working some of those SPP methods into their training, and the athlete should be able to benefit from that uh, quite significantly. Um, so, starting out, I do have some notes today. I, the show is unscripted. I don't have exactly everything. I just have some notes I do need to kind of stay on topic. I do have a couple parts that I may read uh, directly, but I'm going to start out with sports-specific preparedness, SSP, okay? And this 
is, let me back up just a second. I'm not making this stuff up, okay? Do your research on this. There's a lot of information out there um, that backs all of this up. You just need to go through it and and figure out what applies to you and how you need to apply it. So I'm going back actually to some of the Russian manuals that came out uh, back in the 80s. This information is not outdated by any means, okay? Um, but this information was very good. It came from the Eastern Bloc countries, mostly Russian uh, countries. One of those was, I'm going to just put the books up here really quick. Um, one of them being Fundamentals of Special Strength Training and Sport by Yuri Vorkashansky. Uh, excellent. I have not completed that book. It is very technical, very thick uh, reading, but I have hit certain parts of it, and certain parts of it I will use directly today. Another one, A System of Multi-Year Training and Weightlifting uh, by Alexei Medvedev. And he's going to hit some things uh, that really define... Uh, especially the, uh, really all of it, sports specific and the special physical preparedness. Uh, another one that I don't have a copy of it right here with me. I do have it printed. It's somewhere. Uh, but it's the development of the Russian conjugate sequence system, which you can find online. Uh, it's by Tom Mislinsky. Uh, you should be able to find it on Elite. If you just search the title, Development of the Russian Conjugate Sequence System, it should pop up as, I think, the second um, the second article, if you just do a quick Google search for it. Uh, but you can find it on EliteFTS.com. Those are probably going to be the three primary things I'm taking information from today. So, um, But it's, it's in, there's plenty of information out there. You just have to research it and find it and not misinterpret it. So... Um, starting out, SSP, Sports Specific Preparedness. What is that? That is the competition exercises. Okay, so uh, if you vary from the competition exercise, it's no longer SSP. Okay, and there's a con there's a there's a uh, continue or a, um, a um, uh, what's the word a continuum, uh, if you will. Between G, from GPP all the way to SSP, from your general all the way to your specific, there's a continuum. Not everything is perfectly general, not everything is perfectly special, and not everything is perfectly uh, specific. These things, um, some of them kind of fall in the middle. You know, there's a gray area. But there's some things that are almost sports specific, but they're not quite, so they should still be considered special. Uh, and there's some that are they're similar to special, but they fall more in the general terms. And I'll try to hit some of that um, and explain why. But don't think of it as this perfect world. Okay, but SSP is the competition exercises. So uh, it's the most easily defined of, the, of all of them, and it's the one thing that I think people want to screw up because they want everything to fall under that term specific. Not everything is specific. We need to define what the specific is before we can start setting up what special and what general are. Uh, so the competition exercise, I'm going to give four different examples here. The first three will fall under um, strength sports. And then the fourth one, I'm going to get into a, um, a kind of your, one of your regular type of sports. I don't know what regular means, but um, anyway. So for powerlifting... Let's do weightlifting first. I think it's the easiest one out of all of them. So weightlifting. Your competition exercises is the clean and jerk and the snatch. All right. If you only do a clean, it's not a competition exercise. Therefore, it should not fall under your sport-specific preparedness. If you're only doing jerks, the same thing. It's not the competition exercise. Why? Because there's a difference when you have to clean and then jerk a weight following that clean. Okay. If you're power cleaning to a jerk, not competition exercise, not specific. Okay. Highly specialized, but not specific. All right. And that's that we need to make that distinction. Okay. Because it, especially depending upon how you train, 
or how you work with the athletes, whatever class of athletes you work with, this defines what you should be doing and when you should be doing it. Okay. So for weightlifting, full competition style, clean and jerk is exercise number one. And exercise number two would be the full competition style snatch. Okay. So if, if, Anything that varies from what the, that athlete will be doing in competition breaks from that competition exercise or from the sport-specific um, pre preparedness stage of training. Powerlifting. Okay, it becomes a little bit more complicated here because depending on if we're talking about a raw lifter or a geared lifter, and then gear could be single ply or multi ply. So those things come into play as well. So let's look at a raw lifter. It's very simple. Squat, competition style squat. Same stance width, same bar location on your back. Um, exactly what you would be doing in competition. If you wear knee sleeves, if you those should be on. If in competition, if those, and those should be on in training if you're doing sport specific uh, preparedness. If you wear, um, but basically that would be it for a raw lifter. If you start moving your stance in or out, then you're breaking from that sport specific um, mode of training. Bench press, okay, same thing. Bench press with the same grip width, the same setup, whether you train with an arch or without an arch, or whether you compete with the Compete is the key word with an arch, without an arch, um, with your feet tucked, with your feet out in front, with if your feet are up on the toes, depending upon the federation, or feet flat. Uh, however you're going to do it in competition is how it's done. If you're wanting to hit that sport-specific uh, preparedness, that's how it should be done in training. Deadlift. What shoes are you wearing? Um, belt, non-belt. Sumo, conventional, okay? So if you're a sumo puller in competition and you're pulling conventional, it is not sport-specific preparedness, okay? It does not fit into that SSP mold. It has to mimic what you do in competition. Now, when we go to gear, then the, this starts to change. So if you squat with gear in competition and you squat without gear in training, it's not uh, sport-specific, Okay, it doesn't hit the criteria for sports specific because your technique, the squatting with gear and squatting without gear and benching with gear, benching without gear are different things. Okay, they need to be looked at as such. They are completely different. Don't think that if you bench 400 pounds or 300 pounds or whatever your bench is in training raw, that you can go put a bench shirt on and get 200 pounds out of it instantly. I, I, I wasn't a great bencher. I definitely wasn't a great bencher in a shirt. But I never even got 100 pounds out of my shirt. Okay, I, I never got that much. So And it took a lot of work to get what I got out of it. I think the most I got was around 70 pounds. Um, I was close to 100 at one meet. Uh, had it red lighted, um, so I didn't get it. But 70, probably 60 to 100 pounds is the range that I would typically fall in. Um, there's a totally different skill component when you're training with gear. So if you're trying to get your sports specific preparedness in training, then you need to mimic the exact gear that you're using, using in competition. You need to use that exact same gear in training. Okay, so if you're using whatever shirt it is, you're using the same shirt. Maybe you do different shirts on different attempts. That's fine. Uh, any one of those shirts would fit the criteria because you're using all of them in competition. But you should probably try to use all of them before you get to the meet. Same thing with the squat suit. Same thing with knee wraps. Whatever you're using in competition needs to be utilized in training for the sport-specific preparedness component of your training. Okay. okay, let's move on from powerlifting. Let's get to strongman. This is no different. 
If you've been following what I've said, of powerlifting and weightlifting, you should already have a handle on what, or an idea of what would fall under sports-specific preparedness for strongman. And I think this probably starts to get a little bit more complicated because strongman has so many different events. And for the most part, I really don't follow strongman. So if I misstate something, I apologize. Um, I do like to watch World Strongest Man. I really enjoy it, actually. But I know Strongman itself is a little different than World's Strongest Man. The events are a little bit different. Um, TV, they tend to air, try to push a little bit more of the endurance stuff versus uh, Strongman events. Non-World's Strongest Man probably focus a little bit more on the maximal strength side of things. But it still revolves around what you're going to be doing in competition. So, And maybe not everything you can train for. You know, maybe there's certain events that you don't have the ability to train for. You just kind of have to go to the uh, event and maybe you try to find certain, get it close. Uh, but you're not falling into that sports specific preparedness unless you can mimic what you're going to be doing at the um, actual event uh, that you're competing at. And if our memory serves me correctly, you don't always know all the events you're going to be competing at, which makes it even more difficult. Uh, but the events that you know, or the events that are regularly occurring, you can train specifically, okay? Um, and you need to mimic exactly what you're going to face in competition. So if the um, if they're doing a keg toss, but all you have is kettlebells, that's different, okay? It's very similar, but it's still different. So it wouldn't fall under the umbrella of sports-specific preparedness, uh, but it would be probably very specialized but still again mimic what you're going to face in competition um, to the best of your ability I know it gets a little bit more difficult with strongman and, and all the different implements and, and things that uh, you could be facing in competition but uh, let's move on from there and go to soccer okay this is the only sport I'm going to cover uh, versus I'm not going to get into baseball or football or anything. I think soccer can get the point across. But soccer does a number of different drills, okay, uh, with the ball. They love to do everything with the ball, which is good. I'm not uh, criticizing that by any means. Uh, but not everything falls under specifics. So if they just get a ball out and they do a juggling drill or they do a passing drill or they do a dribbling drill, that's not sport specific. That's highly, um, maybe even on the lower end of highly specialized, but it's not specific. Okay. And remember, I talked about a continuum. There's your GPP way over on one side. And I used to, when I worked with interns, I used to draw this out on a, on a dry erase board, but I don't have that today. So, uh, but you have your GPP on one side, your SPP fits right in the middle, your special physical preparedness. And then your SSP would be at the high end of that uh, continuum where your most specific items lie. Dribbling, let's say you're doing a dribbling drill by yourself, okay, with just one athlete doing a dribbling drill. That would fall on the lower end of that uh, specific preparedness, but, or actually closer to the specialized, okay? Probably it would be a special exercise, um, probably right there in the middle. But now you're going to change it a little bit, and you're going to add in a defender. So now you that, that person doing the dribbling drill has a defender that's trying to mess them up or take the ball away. Now it's moving up that scale or up that continuum towards the sports specific preparedness aspect um, of that, that high end. Okay. If you add in maybe a second defender or you put a goal in there that they have to get to, now you're moving again closer to sports specific, but you're not there yet. Okay. So let's take it a step further. Uh, soccer loves to do small sided games or small sided drills. So they'll do, 2v2, 3v3, 5v5, and they'll work it all the way up. 
So you, let's take it from that dribbling drill with the defender now to a 3v3 uh, game. Now you're getting closer, okay? So now we're, we've moved up into that, that gray, that really gray area as far between special physical preparedness and sports specific preparedness, okay? But we, the only way to get to sports specific preparedness is to do 11 v 11 full field scrimmage, okay? Um, and even with the scrimmage, it's gonna start, it's not 100% because, unless you run it like a game, okay? And, it, and that's really getting kind of nitpicky there, but understand the competition exercise is the sports specific preparedness that's the ultimate sports specific preparedness anything less than that is falls starts to begin to move down that continuum closer to the uh, the special or the, the SPP um, criteria of training um, so hopefully that clears up sports specific because especially back in the in the 90s early 2000s uh, people love to throw out that term i want my training to be sport specific good go train your athletes with the sport that's how you do it um and i still think that that mindset is out there depending upon the sport uh, some sports embrace uh, different training not being everything sport specific um, but the, the idea of sport specific has really just been um kind of messed up and misinterpreted and it's taken from it sounds good we want it to be sports specific but when you go into the weight room or you start changing training it's just no longer specific um, and we need to recognize that fact okay so let's move on to SPP and this is where it starts to get more complicated um, but the whole idea of SPP is similar to the competition in a couple different ways, we're going to look at two different ways that you're going to break that down, but it must lead to sport technical mastery. If it doesn't lead to sport technical mastery, then it shouldn't be considered um, SPP. Okay. Now there's two different classes, and I'm taking this from um, Alexei Medvedev's books that I just put up there, Medvedev. Alexei Medvedev's book that I just put up there. Um, put it up there again because it's it's an excellent source of information. A system of training, a system of multi-year training in weightlifting. Okay, but don't think that this has to be just taken. It says weightlifting. Don't think it has to be just taken from weightlifting because some of these books that that. Um, these, these Russian manuals are taken from different areas, gymnastics, uh, track and field, um, weightlifting, of course, as you just saw the head the, you know, that book, but, um, but they're taking the concepts and then they apply them to different sports. And if you read Verkashansky's book, he talks about multiple different sports. Verkashansky was primarily a track and field um, guy. But he talks about boxing, he talks about uh, shot put, he talks about uh, soccer, I believe is in there. He takes different aspects and explains how it relates to those sports. One of the parts of this section that I'm really focusing on, on Medvedev's book, is taken from, and I have not seen this book, um, or at least I haven't read it, I don't have it, So, but it's taken from L.P. Met. Matveyev, not Medvedev, but Matveyev, um, and the title of that book is The Fundamentals of Sport Training, okay, not weightlifting, not powerlifting, sport training, and they, they, that's where they really came up with this SSP, SPP, GPP, uh, that I'm trying to explain right now, but there's two categories of SPP, okay, one is your supplemental, so, your supplemental is used to master the technique, okay? Whatever sport technique that you have. And this is really easily explained in weightlifting or powerlifting terms. Uh, but it has a highly technical emphasis. So for me, as a power or as a former powerlifter, um, 
that really and that embraces my second exercise that is the concept of my second exercise of the day um, as well as the first exercise many times because those two exercises are going to mimic the technique. I rotate exercises just like West Side Barbell. Every week I'm pretty much doing something different as my main exercise. That's going to be one that highly correlates to the technical aspects of my squat bench and deadlift. My second exercise is a little bit more loose but still mimics that, that technical aspects um, fairly closely but starts to get into more of the musculature, which I don't want to get too far into that yet. But but those still would be considered supplemental. Okay, um, they're used to master the movement. Okay, the the movement that we're trying to improve. Well, the second class of special exercises is the developmental. Okay, and that's going to focus more on the musculature involved or the strength aspect of the muscles involved. Um, it's developing the physical qualities of the exercise, of the competitive exercise. So when you think about this, we're thinking about building the muscle to build the movement. Build the muscle first, then that will correspond or correlate into the movement, provided training is, is organized properly. Okay, so... This would fit into, if you are familiar with a lot of Louis Simmons stuff, where he talked about uh, special exercise and he would say the inverse curl is a special exercise. And I'd say for a long time I would disagree with that. And this would be similar if you don't know what an inverse curl is. I would compare it, the best comparison I could give is to a machine-based uh, glute ham raise. But... Um, so for a long time, I disagree with that because I always felt that the movement was so much more important than the musculature that the musculature would be, would actually fall under a general exercise, not necessarily GPP, but a, a general exercise to improve the strength that you want to improve. Um, but that's actually not correct. It just falls under that developmental class of SPP or special physical preparedness. Um, for S something to be constituted as SPP, we need to consider the principles of dynamic correspondence. Okay, principles of dynamic correspondence. Uh, first time I believe, I don't know. Yuri Verkashansky's book that I put up a minute ago, Fundamentals of, Sp of Special Strength Training in Sport, um, I believe was the name of that, is where the first time that I saw that defined. Uh, it's also written about in Tom Maslinsky's uh, thesis, The Development of the Russian Conjugate Sequence System. It's most likely in Super Training by Mel Sif. Um, but these are the factors. If you can't um, meet... The standards of the principles of dynamic correspondence. You should be questioning why you're utilizing that exercise if it's a primary part of your program. And SPP should be a primary part of your program, especially in the strength sports. Um, but even in this, uh, even in regular sports, the SPP is highly beneficial and has a very high, or should have a very high correlation to the sport itself or to that SSP, the competition exercises. So if you don't meet the principles of dynamic correspondence, then you're probably not in that special region and it should be moved down in your training and not considered to be as important as you may want it to be. Um, so the principles of dynamic correspondence, and I'm going to have to read this. Um, and actually, let me scroll up here and see if I missed something. Okay, so, yeah, this is probably a little bit more important, and I'm going to read this too. I'm reading it out of my notes, so it's not like I'm just reading from a book. But this is from the development of the Russian conjugate sequence system. By Thomas Linsky, and he's actually quoting, or he's took this from um, 
Verkashansky. So there's four things that are the principal aims of special strength training. So since we're talking about special physical preparedness, this is exactly what you're trying to accomplish with your SPP exercises. Okay, so this is what you're trying to do, and I'll go over um, the qualifications for that are the principles of dynamic correspondence, which I'll hit just as, after this. Um, the principal aims, number one, converging the partial effects of the strength training means. Okay, so understand that not all strength training correlates directly to the sport, and this does not matter. This doesn't matter if we're talking about soccer or baseball or powerlifting or weightlifting. Not all strength exercises correlate directly to improvement in the sport. Not all exercises you do for the bench press to improve the bench press correlate directly. So I would say for a younger lifter, shoulder exercises such as lateral raises and front raises, and I would include the posterior delts and do the rear raises as well, will have a contribution to your bench press. Early on, they probably have a higher contribution. Later on, down the road, after you've been uh, training, competing for 10 years plus, they probably aren't going to have the same level of... Um, they won't have the same level of effectiveness. Doesn't mean you shouldn't be doing them. Just understand that they are only giving you a partial effect of the strength in your shoulders and that you need to have other exercises that you bring in to take that, what you got out of those raises, to convert that to the strength you need for the bench. Okay, so it goes, my notes go on to say there, um, over time, the results of sequential loading causes an accumulation of training effects which merge from the necessary traits required for success in the mature sporting form. Okay, so that's basically what I just said. You're going to start off with those simple exercises and then you need to progress to exercises that take that strength that you gain from those, those general exercises early on in your training, that take that strength and convert it over the course of time to your sport specific form of the actual bench press. So you may move on from the raises early on in early phases of your training or early blocks of your training or periods of your training or whatever you want to call it. Um, those simple general exercises there, then you start bringing in different sort of pressing exercises that start to converge that strength into the strength you want. So after you do the raises, you may switch to more inc maybe dumbbell or millet, dumbbell um, incline presses, dumbbell bench presses, dumbbell overhead presses, and start converting that strength. And then after doing that for a while, you're gonna start to move into maybe barbell incline, barbell overhead press, and then on to your bench press. Okay. But the, each one of those contributes a part to the whole, the overall whole that you're trying to accomplish. You just need to be, and this is a very generic example, you just need to be very selective in what exercises you're doing so that they do build upon each other over the course of time. Okay. Uh, point number two. This is Principal Aims of Special Strength Training by Verkashansky. Point number two. Accelerating Specific Adaptation. Um... That being, to allow selective adaptation to occur, the construction and introduction of SPP must be introduced sequentially and based upon the specific demands required from the athlete's specific sport. Okay, so this just takes it, it's basically what I just said uh, under point number one. It's very similar, but this is going to say I probably took the first point a little bit too far but and got into this one. You need to first look at the specifics of the sport. Okay, You always look at that first and then you start breaking it down. What are, what do I need to improve this? Okay, Then what do I need to improve that? So if the sport is A and I'm going to use B, C, and D to improve it, okay, B has a direct correlation to A. But what do I need to do to improve B? Okay, that's what C falls under. 
what do I need to do to improve C? Well, that's going to be from D. D improves C, C improves B, B improves A. Okay, and that will, it's basically training the parts to create the whole. Okay, um, but by, with doing that, we have to base, we always base it off the whole or the SSP or the athlete specific sport. Okay, that comes first, then we determine everything else from that. Part number, point number three, specific correspondence of the training effect. Okay, at each stage in the process of achieving sports mastery, the appropriate selection must reflect and secure the athlete's current motor potential. Basically, don't get ahead of yourself and don't, um, I'd really leave it at that, I think. Um, so if in early stages of training, and and I always bring up Westside because it really has had a tremendous influence on my training, even though I don't utilize their exact methods. It's highly, re there's many reflective elements of that, um, both in how I trained athletes when I was coaching at the college level, as well as in my own training, um, as well as in my wife's training when she was running long distances, uh, doing half marathons, and even when she ran her marathon, I utilized elements. This Westside had such a, a, uh, an impact on my thought process and how I go about uh, doing things, even though I've I've varied or I've I've moved on in, in such a great way, but that's my roots. You know, that's that's where my roots came from. So I kind of think in, in terms of that, and I bring them up a lot uh, because they've had such an impact on the strength field in general, especially in the strength sports. Uh, but even going beyond that, um, but one of the things that's commonly said by Louis and by Westside Barbell. Uh, those that still teach his methods, is that you always train so you're at your highest. Well, in reality, that doesn't actually happen. Um, you can't be at your highest um, peak level performance year-round. Okay, And that was kind of the claim at Westside, and based off how they trained, is that they always wanted to be close to their their top level of performance, um, but it, it has goes as well documented that that doesn't happen. Okay, you're always going to have periods of time where you're not at your peak. It's why sports don't go year round. If if they could, if they could, football would last. Imagine how much money would be in football if they played it 365 days a year. Um, or 52 weeks a year, I should say, but that's not possible. Okay. These guys need a break because their body breaks down over time, but we want their training and I'm probably way off course right now. We want their training to peak at the right time. So those teams that are going to the playoffs and the Super Bowl are playing at their highest level of play at those games because those are the most important games of the year but they have to be at a fairly high level prior to that to make sure that they make the playoffs okay because if they don't make the playoffs it doesn't matter what sort of shape they're in when they get to the playoffs um and i can i remember listening i'm i'm even digging myself more in a hole getting off topic right now but i remember listening to thomas linsky talk he was at an nsca conference uh years ago and he he talked about his experience in the NFL and how players would, he considered himself not to be a great player. I do believe he was a starting offensive lineman, but he considered himself not to be a great player. And he said during the season, the regular season, he could stand up and play with almost anyone. And then they'd get to the playoffs and those same players, if they had played them already uh, prior to the playoffs, he couldn't keep up with them. 
defensive players just blow right past them. He said because when they got to the playoffs, they would actually turn it up a little because they were such phenomenal and over-the-top great athletes that they took their training, they took their their playing to a whole nother level. Um, and that was what kind of backing up that point that not that they s- saved themselves, they were just able to find another level or another gear. Um, and that backs up the point that you're not in your top um, performance levels. You're not in your top states of preparedness year round. Okay, so going back to that point, point number three, specific correspondence of the training effect. And basically at each stage of the process of achieving sport mastery, the appropriate selection must reflect the athlete's current motor potential. So early stages of training, you're not going to be at your highest um, preparedness level, your current motor potential. So you don't want to jump too fast and train with your specific means, your sports specific, excuse me, your sports specific means, your competitive exercises may not need to be performed early on in training. Look at a weightlifter. Do they need to do a full clean and jerk or a full snatch in 12 weeks out from a meet? If their technique is horrible, maybe they do. But if they have good, solid technique, they should probably be focusing more on those special exercises, clean pulls, power cleans, um, snatch or overhead squats, um, snatches from blocks, cleans from blocks, jerks from the rack. Build up the special exercises so when they get to those most important periods of training going into the competition, they can bring in the comp- the competition exercises and get the most out of them because they built the whole through the parts. And they do it in sequential stages and their motor potential is built throughout those uh, stages. Point number four, maintaining the strength effect. Okay, um, as sporting proficiency rises, the successful preservation of training effects depends on the systematic sequential loading and the introduction of more effective training means. This goes away from the philosophy that you have to train at your highest level all the time. Okay, pick the exercise. The exercises that are picked will preserve the pre- what you were doing in the previous stage if you're selecting them appropriately okay so one stage of training will lead into the next the the subsequent phase of training or period of training will maintain what was built in the previous block or phase of training okay um and that's really important that you that training is planned in that manner and you have to utilize the correct types of exercises the correct exercises in order to do that Okay, and and their your your regimes of work and your methods of loading and different all that will build upon each other if you do it correctly, and it will end up by the time you get to your final stages of training, you being at the highest level going into the competition. Okay, um, and a lot of this is really defining block periodization or what you your focus is or how or what should be happening uh throughout the different blocks and i'm going to get more into block periodization later it is too complex to do unless i get through all these these introductory talks first um understanding gpp spp ssp the different strength training means special exercises and, and i can keep going but that's setting up a whole different conversation okay so um Principles of dynamic correspondence. This is what I started to get to earlier. You cannot, if an exercise that you're doing does not satisfy the principles of dynamic correspondence, it should not be considered a special exercise. You may need it as a general exercise or part of your GPP training. Uh, That's to be debated, and we'll discuss that later. But it shouldn't be a highly regarded, I have to have this exercise, unless it fits the principles of dynamic correspondence. What are the principles of dynamic correspondence? Number one, the amplitude and direction of movement, okay? That has to be satisfied. What does that mean? 
the amplitude is the range of motion. That's all it is. The, essentially the range of motion that you're going to be going through. So um, how big is that range of motion? Is it a large range of motion or a small range of motion? You can measure it um, in strength training terms. You can measure it by the degrees of movement from a joint. Okay, are you at 50 degrees of movement? Are you at 120 degrees of movement? If you're, if the sporting action requires 120 degrees of movement with the, from a joint, and you're only giving it 30 degrees, it does not fit that that point of it, that principle of dynamic correspondence. Okay, what about the direction? Uh, is it a flexion, mus muscular flexion, or muscular, or joint flexion or joint extension okay uh the the example that i think it was verkashansky gave in his book to satisfy that element was a shot putter versus a rower a rower is in in a boat you know rowing um well a rower is pulling okay that that movement he is extending his shoulder a shot putter on the other hand is Flexing the shoulders, going through joint flexion. They may have similar total range of motion, but the direction of the movement is different because one is going, and they're using like the same musculature, um, one being more posterior oriented and the other more anterior oriented, but one is going through an extension, pulling his arm back, extension of the shoulder, versus the other one, flexion of the shoulder, um, or pushing his arm back forward okay so in that manner for a um for a bench press you know and this doesn't necessarily exclude one versus the other but a bench press flexion of the shoulder extension of the elbows a row extension of the shoulder uh flexion of the elbows so it's the opposite there are reasons to do rows to support your bench press, okay? But you shouldn't probably consider a row as a, um, based on that principle of dynamic correspondence, you should not consider a row um, falling under that principle of the amplitude and direction of movement. Direction of movement is completely opposite, okay? Uh, Principle number two, the accentuated region of force production. Okay, where in the range of motion is strength necessary? Is it necessary? Uh, bench press is easy to look at, so we'll continue to look at that. Is a lot of force necessary at the bottom of that? Let's see if I can zoom out just a little bit. I cannot. Maybe I can back up. Okay, so with the bench press, do I need... A lot of force at the bottom to get it going and less force at the top or do I need more less force in the bottom and more force at the top you're probably going to need to exert a lot more force in the bottom of that bench press and less force as at least as far as your pecs and shoulders more force in the bottom and less force in the top to get it locked out versus I mean your triceps is kind of the op kind of the opposite Anyway, I'm just going to keep moving on on this and get into a big debate. I think you guys can get my point I'm trying to make. Um, and I am looking very closely at my notes as I'm doing this. Um, so you have to, to satisfy this principle of dynamic correspondence, you have to display proper force in the proper range of motion or in the proper movement. You have to um, train the force at the proper uh, place. Another example using the bench press is using a bench shirt. Uh, this is from my notes from years ago that you, in the bench shirt, you're going to get assistance from the shirt in the bottom. You still got to exhibit a lot of force, but you get assistance in the bottom to get that bar moving. Now, the, the uh, range of force that range of force production that you really need to focus on is developing a strength in the triceps to lock it out at the top because you don't get as much help there. So looking at a raw versus a, um, a geared power lifter, a raw power lifter needs to 
be very strong in the chest and the shoulder to get that bar moving off their chest versus a geared power lifter is going to have to be very strong at the top, really develop their lockout and develop their, their triceps uh, for that to carry over and get the most correspondence out of that exercise. Uh, point Principle number three, uh, the dynamics of the effort. What are... When we're considering... Okay, high velocity versus low velocity. So a boxer is going to throw punches, and you would think, oh, they have to be very strong. They don't actually. They have to be very fast. And unloaded movements, which I would consider a punch, an unloaded movement until you make contact, you have to, uh, that velocity is not controlled by maximum strength. Versus a bench press or a shot put, um, use a shot put as an example, that you're going to have to have a lot more high force production even though you're still going through, you know, a punch here versus a shot put here, and I know it's different. Uh, let's not get into that. Let's focus on this, just this principle, the dynamics of the effort. The shot put, you're going to have to have a lot more force generated. So developing maximal strength that carries over to the shot put would be extremely important. Not as important as a punch thrown in boxing, okay? Uh, because the velocity... Unloaded speed doesn't have the same prerequisite of maximum strength as loaded speed. So the dynamics of the effort is the force being produced equal or greater to the sport. So if, if when you're looking at the, the exercise that you're trying to improve or that you're utilizing to improve the sport exercise, when you're looking at that exercise, does it produce enough force to carry over to the sport or do those forces match if they're too different you're not going to get the same level of correspondence that you want out of those exercises okay um, speed of displaying maximal effort this is where power comes into play okay or your explosive strength so your speed in the if you're choosing a special exercise the speed must be similar to that of the competitive exercise um, it doesn't necessarily, there are reasons, you know, when you look at, I'm going to go back to West Side's training again, they utilize dynamic effort training and they, they train with bands, with chains, okay, that speed of those exercises, a lot of times faster than the, than the exercises that they're trying to improve, but they're trying to improve the explosive strength to get that rate of force development very high. Um, and, and so they should still be trying to develop the same amount of force. They're trying to do it faster. Okay. So there is a reason to do that in some instances, but if the, uh, you know, if you look at jumpers and you take, you overload them trying to improve a jump. Okay, let's look at uh, a high jump, or no, a long jump. And you, and you say, okay, we're going to train your jumping ability by having you wear a 80 pound weight vest or 420 pound weight vest, and you're going to jump, and and that should carry over to your to your long jump. It's probably not going to, because the the speed of movement probably wouldn't compare very well. Not that you couldn't use that at certain periods of training to, to work um, your your heavier explosive work to later on your lighter explosive work. Um, but it's not going to have a very high level of correspondence by itself. Um, so it probably shouldn't fall into your, uh, your special exercise, at least not at a very high level, maybe at a low level. Um, And this kind of makes it look like, oh, well, we shouldn't be squatting because the, the speed is, the maximum effort is too, too, the squat, the maximum effort of a squat is too high and too slow, 
the movement is too slow to compare to a jump. Well, no, I mean, it is. Yes, it is. If you only try to squat and then go try to jump um, and use that as your only basis, yes, but your squat will help build your explosive strength. It just needs to be done in the right phase of training. I would not, and I know there's information contradicting this, but I would not utilize heavy maximal weights in training regularly during the competitive season. Um, maybe at certain points to keep your maximum strength up, but you really don't need it because as you get closer to the competitive, the high, most important competitions, your explosive strength should maintain your maximum strength um, and it should be at a, a speed that more closely replicates the speed of the jump itself. Um, so that's that, um, displaying maximum effort um, in the speed of movement should be, you want, it, the more similar it is in speed, the more correspondence or carryover you'll get to the actual sport movement. Um, and then number point principle number five is the regime of muscular work. The regime of muscular work is going to be, I'll put three basic ones down and then two that are a little bit more detailed. Uh, isometric, eccentric, concentric. Those are your three basic regimes of muscular work. So you don't want to be training someone isometrically for very long periods of time if they're not going to need isometric strength in their sport. And I don't want to get into triphasic training by Cal Dietz because that's a whole nother ball game. Um, but understand, don't spend a lot of time training statically if you have a sport that requires high levels of movement. Okay, um, Sprinters don't need to be doing a lot of isometric work. Doesn't mean they shouldn't ever do it, but it's at a very low correspondence to their competitive exercise. So they need to have the... Uh, more concentric and eccentric, high-speed eccentric movements to correspond better. Now, the other two regimes that I have listed are cyclic and phasic. Okay, cyclic being multiple steps of a sprinter, uh, phasic being the last, the takeoff uh, um, of a jumper. That last hit when I hit the blocks, that's more of a phasic uh, in nature. So those things have a definite carryover, a definite correspondence, and they should be looked at or they should be considered when you're picking your special exercises. Do we need to have a phasic or an isometric or whatever component that will help us get into our sports specific work? Um, so hopefully all of this made sense. I know I went pretty long on this one. Uh, there's a lot that goes into SPP. And I really feel just with this, this is kind of the groundwork. It doesn't really get into what you're doing, uh, which hopefully we'll get into down the road. Um, but if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the comments. Uh, as always, please, if you like what you're seeing here, like the videos uh, and subscribe to the channel. And until next time, I will see you then.